here to change the face of Alabama. We understand the importance of literacy and reading, and we as the people of Alabama say to our state and our nation that we're going to make a difference here in our home, and we're going to spread it abroad. I want to thank all the panel guests for showing up today, and I really want to thank you for being a part of this. Madam Mayor, I want to thank you for being the catalyst of allowing this to happen in your city. I do want you to do something for me, though. They're going to ask me a question, why Christian? I want to ask you, why not Christian? Mm -hmm. I, would, I would have to agree, um, why not Pritchard? Okay. Uh, the city of Pritchard is a, is a great city, and that's just not in, in, in verse. Okay. It's a great city, and the people who live here, who serve here, who play here, who worship here, go to school, learn here, and look for this city to be a place for them to call home. I talk to people to and fro from all over. I've been a lot of places, and I'm never amazed, at least not anymore, to come across people all the way in Las Vegas and say, well, I know about Pritchard, Alabama. Houston, Texas, I'm from Pritchard. As far north as New York, I'm from Pritchard, Alabama. And they always have something very positive to say about what Pritchard gave to them and the great city that Pritchard used to be. And I tell them, it's not so much as where we've been, it's where we're going. Okay. That's why Pritchard. This city is certainly on the move, but this city wants to be a city that wants to nurture and prepare its people for where this, this country is going, for where our future is set. And we're just as important, we're just as vital, we're just as great of a place as any other city that cares for its people in this entire great world that we know. Amen. And what's so important and what's so unique about Pritchard, Alabama is because we are Pritchard, Alabama. Each city has its own name, has its own place, has its own value in this world that we know of. And Pritchard, Alabama is one of the greatest places on this earth. And why not start such a phenomenal movement than right here in Pritchard, Alabama? Why not start such a tremendous turnaround in our culture, in our community, and in this great nation that we call the United States of America than right here in Pritchard, Alabama? And there's an old saying, can anything good come out of this place? Certainly it can. And can these dry bones live? Absolutely it can. And it can live, and it can start and manifest itself. The turnaround that we see, the turnaround that we expect, the turnaround that we believe for our youth, for our future, and for who we are as a people, not just color, but a people of God, can start and will start right here in Pritchard, Alabama. And we are grateful and very excited about where we're going from this day forward. Thank you. Ten years ago, God put me on his mission for literacy. It was at a time where Birmingham was crying with just so high, just killing one another. And I just want to know for myself, was there a real connection between literacy and crime? Myself, I know there was some national evidence and some local uh, um, uh, evidence, but this particular year, 2003, I went down to the police uh, station headquarters in Birmingham and asked, what was the name of the of the 19 people that was killed that was under age 21 that year? They didn't have a name. It just was a number. All all these 19. I took the numbers and I found out who they were. 17 of those 19 was killed by a gun. Either the perpetrator or the victim was illiterate most of the time both. That was 92% was killed by illiteracy alone. Okay? The other two were mama just had uh, met this guy and he basically just killed the two kids, two more. I realized that some must some need to be done. So I went down to the Board of Education, talked to Dr. Shire at the time, who contacted me, Dr. Uh, 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 Deborah Horn at the time, and uh, she was the uh, director of middle school. And Dr. P. Joe, she was over um, high school. They allowed me to go in and do some research. So they sent me to the uh, Washington Elementary School, which they was, they was re 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 back in the school. And I was at the Lincoln Building downtown. I thought I was ready. I interviewed this young man who was in the ninth grade, 15 years old, had failed twice. They wouldn't allow him to fail him three times, so they must pass him. When I looked at him, four generations was illiterate. His, his, his mother was 22 with seven kids. His, mama, his grandma was 38, and his grandma was 52. Four generations of illiterate, illiterate 
family, four generations. I went to my desk and said, Lord, we got to do something. The first thing he said to me is, I want you to walk through my garden, tell the leadership down there, I don't, I don't appreciate how they're treating my kids when it comes to education. I said, Lord, you know I got a car, right? He said, well, i tell you what, I mean, do you want me to go take you back where I got you from? I said, no, don't worry about that. Just, just tell me what you need to do. I, I sat down and wrote, a letter, wrote letters from President Bush all the way down to the constable, the lowest elected official, over 203 letters. Uh, Barbara Bush said thank you for the work, and she couldn't make it. And I, and I went on this walk, and I walked this walk for 10 consecutive years to bring awareness to the, to the literacy crisis. Now God has made that move turn into a TV show called The Solution Desk. And that's what we're here to do, to, to make a pilot to put on air of intelligent, concerned citizens talking about real issues that real people face with real solutions. That's it. None thanks. And um, I just want to thank you all for coming in. The first question I want to pose to um, Pastor uh, Wesley Davis. You've been in law enforcement, you're tied in law enforcement, you're at Marshall's office. What impact do you think illiteracy have on the state of Alabama as it relates to crime? One of my experiences, uh, I was, yes, I did serve uh, 12 and a half years with the U.S. Marshal Service. Uh, and there's a, it's a direct correlation between those who commit crime and those who have a lack of education. Uh, often, many times during sentencing, that we will see the judge will go through a colloquy of questions with the defendant and say, what is your highest level of education completed? Uh, many of them did not complete high school. Um, I could count probably my career how many actually said I graduated from college. When those who, my teacher, Dr. Adjapon at FAMU, he said, those who cannot thrive in the educational system, they are very accomplished in the criminal justice system. And that is a direct correlation between those who don't have education, who don't know how to read, because if you have education, you have power. You have the power to basically, you know, create your own path. And if you don't create your own path, then the path is created for you. And sometimes, for a lot of our young people, the easy way out is crime. Um, Thank you. Uh, I just want to be real with y'all. We're going to be real today. Uh, Attorney uh, Carter, let's be real. We know that Crime has taken a front seat in our communities because of jobs, lack of availability of access to economic growth. Uh, and you're dealing with these kids. I know you get phone calls. They're good kids. No kid born like this. They're, they're created like this, a product of their environment. What impact do you think if these kids were able to understand what they're doing? Do you think it will cartel their behavior in the way that they commit crimes? I'm reminded of uh, kind of the thought process of you, you reap what you sow. So you are, you are around what you know and what you see is what you do. Make, I don't want to cut you, but make that make sense to just the everyday person. Just speak it. If, if all you see is a couple of guys hanging down on the block okay. doing nothing, and you want to be like those guys, you go and hang out with those guys, they become the figures that you emulate. They're living a life of crime, therefore you learn it and you do it and you repeat it because you want to be praised by that crime. So they don't know what right looks like. That's what they see, that's what they know, and they simply repeat it. Okay. Now, I'm a product of a Miss Lacey, retired early from the county school system in Jefferson County, who said that she believed the child's supposed to go to school before they're six years old. I was born September 13th. If you were born after September 1st, you had to wait another year to go to school. Her sacrifice allowed me, when I got to the first grade, to be able to sign my own enrollment card without taking it home. Okay? I believe, and I know in my heart, we'll... Our generation, my generation is one of the most selfish generations on the face of the earth. We want to blame as though we got here without other sacrifice. So I asked God one day, I said, Lord, you know, why is the world such a bad place? He said, go look in the mirror, add your sin to it, and then you come ask me that question. I got you. We act as though the world got the way it is without our sin. Okay? So as a pastor, Joe, 
when you're dealing with sin, and you're hearing what the panel guests have said, and, you, and you're dealing with these people, okay, and the Bible says just clearly, you know, study to show thyself approved unto God. Workmen need not be ashamed, rightfully by the word of truth. How can they study if they can't read? How can they really hear you? So when you when you're dealing with these people, what a woman, what is the biggest challenge you face? Well, whether it's um, a Bible study or a small study group or even at uh, the typical 11 o'clock hour of worship, uh, typically, you know, the scripture would say to all of us, we're all about getting, get an understanding. Amen. And so you really, really uh, have to uh, ask the Holy Spirit to really help you um, realize what's in uh, the audience, what's the educational level uh, of the audience uh, when I was going through uh, school. And as ministers, we were taught that, that we really, really, really needed to know what, as, as, as much as possible, what was the educational background. And you would say, yeah, but in the Old Testament, you didn't have people, and there were no such things as college. Um, but I would still say to you, you, you got to know the audience that you're talking to, what their ability is to be able to understand, because you want when they leave Sunday, uh, that they leave with a sense of, who I am and who I belong to and that takes a lot of work and uh, it is different uh, when you're in a church service versus being in a boardroom uh, with people uh, that are at a higher educational level uh, on particular boards within the church because now the communication and how you communicate is a whole lot easier it doesn't take as much work because you're dealing with people that are at an educational level uh, that we can really kind of, you know, communicate with one another to get things done. Not so from the pulpit, because you have all different educational backgrounds that are sitting in the pews, and everyone in the pew deserves to be able to know the God that they've fallen in love with. And it is a, it is, if that pastor or that minister is worth their salt, they are really going to ask the Holy Spirit to help them work hard so that the person with a doctor's degree or the person that stopped school in that sixth grade can walk out of that door in love with God. Oh. But it is an incredible challenge. Okay, now, he's going to sit up here and watch this show. I ain't got food on my table. I have heard this before. You know, I have heard of all this before. Who going to come to my community? You know, I'm scared of my own children. I've lost two of my children to the streets, to drugs. So I'm asking you, um, Dr. Prenshaw, you're teaching, you're, you're educating. On a higher level, when you when you're dealing with these kids that have passed through first through the twelfth grade and entered out of high school, and you say in your mind, I know they're prepared. So when you stand up to teach, can you really teach? Are you really effective? Are they really have, have they put it like this? Have they been trained properly to get all out of you that's available? Uh, I would say definitely not, because we found at Bishop State that students are coming to us less prepared. Okay. Uh, and especially mathematics. Okay. Uh, and, and, and the approach that I use and I teach business statistics is that I assume they know nothing. Okay. And, and that's the approach. You know nothing. Don't come here and interfere. I assume you know nothing. If I have to go back and show you how to round a number, uh, add a number, then they do that. One advantage you have in a community college. The other thing is that we have to make sure that they know how much we care. My, my. Before they understand and appreciate what you give them. Could you say that again? Please say that again. They don't, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. My, my. And, and, and I just believe that not only in the, in the high school level and middle school level, but also in the college level. I can remember all of the teachers who influenced me. It wasn't as much as academic, but as the interest they showed me coming from a single family or a single mom who was on welfare, who went to a school, they said, with number nothing but thugs came out of it. But you have to have that, 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 uh, that inner self-belief in yourself. Self-motivation is better than any motivation because nobody can take that away from you. And once you believe that there's something special about you, then God will put you in very special places and take very un you know, unusual regular people to do extraordinary things. So that's the approach I use and I find it been very effective that uh, we, we know unfortunately that our kids take mathematics the first two years uh, and then they stop. Well, the school system will be counting that now implemented where they take math every year. So by the time they get to the uh, college level, they would not have forgotten. My, my. I, I've been saving this question for you, um, Ms. Matthews. I, I really have. And, 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 you know, and it's touching. 
because I looked at you, you your, your credentials here, that you're pro di program director for the 100 black men of Great Mobile, a, a lady, a female. I know in this male chauvinist society that we have a way of looking at women, and we got to deal with this. But somehow these 100 black men look at you in such a way that you can, that your soft is worth its text that you're over and director of this organization, right? When you look at the plight of young black men over to today, what do you think the best approach to use to get their ears in tune to what you have to say? Well, my main motto is what they see is what they'll be. My mind. So we have to really be role models for that. Could you say that again? I'm just like, I, I believe in repeating. What they see is what they'll be. My, my. So what you want to say? So you're saying is what they see ain't necessarily got to be their future. But is if you're a positive role model, my, my. and you actually mentor them in an effective way, my, my. with enough times getting together, what they see is what they will eventually want my, to be. My, my. But also, we need to realize that what we're dealing with now. It's not what a lot of us have dealt with down through the years. We have almost an amoral culture. Okay. So, make, make that make sense to just the yeah. every, everyday person. So you... Amoral. There are no morals. Okay. They don't have a compass to go by. So you have to really get to the brass tacks of it and what you think. And the reason why a lot of us are shocked with the things that they do is that they really not, haven't had the role models in the way that we think about it. Everything is anything goes. So if you sort of meet them where they are and have those deep conversations and don't let that conversation alarm you, Mama. but then start molding and guiding <coughs> in such a way where they, you can get them to see the light. And our thing is you have to really throw away what you have when you're dealing with them one-on-one, -on -one, don't be judgmental, but also try to get to get an understanding. And then once you said, like Dr. Crenshaw said, if they know that you care, that is one of the biggest things because a lot of them, they don't have that person that they can reach out to because in the homes, a lot of times they get cursed out on, on the regular, as the kids say. So they don't really get that love and nurture that we sort of assume that happens within a home. Amen. So we have to very, be very careful to strip away those things and then try to start almost at the very beginning. Like okay. uh, Pastor Joe said, we look like that, you don't know what you have. Okay. Uh, uh, Ms. Bettis, mm -hmm. you're the PTA in, in, in this area. I remember the high school I went to, uh, Jackson Olden High, and initially had about 1,800 students at one point when you first opened. I went to a PTA meeting. I want you to hear this now. I went to a PTA meeting one time. Out of, I think it was like seven, 1,782 students, 30 parents showed up. Blew my mind. I don't know if that alarms you or it's the same here than it was in, in certain cases in our community. I just want you to expound on that to bring some clarity to the importance of parents being involved in their children's education, no matter what their, what their situation may be? Um, it, that's quite interesting because my children are a part of a private school where I'm, I'm the PTA president. Okay. But however, I work with another local school, the Mobile County Training School. Okay. And in visiting and trying to help them build their PTA because that is very much the issue of there is no um, interest from parents. And so, I don't know if the difference is that when you have parents who are actually paying some money, okay. they feel like they need to show up because I want to get my money for it. Okay. Versus they're getting a free education, but it is just as valuable now, don't get me wrong, okay. it is just as valuable. I mean, I'm a product of public school as well. Okay. And what I came back with uh, to the, the parent coordinator was, we have to figure out what the parents need. Go back to what you said. There's no food to eat. Right. You know, my power's been turned off. Um, they can't 
here that it's important to be at that PTA meeting because there are some real life situations that they feel are more important. However, we know that that's not true. Okay. That is important okay. because that's affecting their child's ability to learn as well. But if you're not in the room, we can't get you the help that you need. Mm -hmm. And so what my recommendation was, why don't we start, don't make it about the PTA meeting, but make it about them. Do a resource fair. Mm -hmm. Okay, Amen. you got them there. Amen. Bring in community action. Amen. Bring in Catholic charities. Bring in some of the agencies who might speak, be sister. able to help speak, them. Speak, speak to the camera. That speak might the be camera. able to help them. Bring those folks in. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Once you got them there, mm -hmm. let me talk with you about little Jim. Amen. Let me tell you what's going on. This is your teacher. You know, we want you to meet this person and know. And it seems that there, um, there's. How do you make it more personable between the teachers? And how do you make it more personal with the parents? I don't see the same relationship uh, with teachers and parents like it was when I was a child. Mm -hmm. And so you have to look at how you begin to engage. And I know the teachers in public school systems are taxed. Okay. I've heard it. I have people. I know people that work there. But we have to figure out it's relationship. Amen. And we have to understand that just because that parent is not there, it's not always that they don't care. They may be working that second or third job, or it just may be that there are other little ones at home and they're busy just trying to figure out. Okay. It, 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 this is what's so perplexing to me. When we talk about education, when I was growing up, it was happiness. It's where you met your friends. You was glad to go to school. You was glad to learn. You know, we didn't have all these gadgets and all this um, uh, toys and things that, 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 we, that these kids have now, availability to the whole world through internet. 26 years in the education system. How can we turn this, this dreary look on education that we have allowed to have? How then can we turn it around that people can be happy in speaking about education? Kids can be happy again going to be educated. Teachers can be happy again because they know they're coming to a school where kids want to learn. How do we change that? Well, first issue is um, readiness for education. It begins with the early childhood. It begins with parenting skills. And it begins with preschool readiness. Okay, preschool, when, you say, when you say preschool readiness. Preschool is a problem. Okay. For, it's not affordable throughout the state. And many people, many young people, as we talked about with young people getting pregnant early, uh, therefore, a young girl, 15 years old, gets pregnant and she has a child. She has to go to work at McDonald's. Mama. That means that child is left at home with grandma, who may be there keeping the child but watching soap operas. Here's another kid over here who's parent. Two parents coming together, they, uh, one parent making a sacrifice and they enroll their child in the early childhood program. Okay. You have a typical preschool, uh, kindergarten program at age five when compulsory school age began. A class would have 15 students in it. Ten of those would come from a preschool program. Five of them would come from grandmama. Okay. Those kids are then under a new teacher who has just finished Alabama, Auburn, whatever school. They all teach the same thing, methodologies. Okay. That is grouping kids according to their ability level. And so the teacher groups a kid with my red birds, my blue birds, and these are my buzzards. Okay. Those kids start off two years behind and they never catch up. And as they go throughout the schooling experience, that buzzard mindset that has been pressed into them. My, my. It's a crusher of self-esteem, so they don't like school. When the parents are called to the conference, the teachers say, oh, my red birds are doing great. My blue birds are fine, but I don't know what's wrong with these buzzards. No, and then the parents jump on the kids. What's wrong with you? There's nothing wrong with the ability. Reverend said it earlier. When God made the man, nothing was wrong with him. The problem is readiness. Okay. They're not ready to begin to make sense of print or to have numbers be assigned meaning. And as a result, as they go through school, being crushed in their mindset, by the time they reach third grade, they're introduced to textbooks. 
science and social studies. And now they get to fourth grade and they may come to their first African American teacher. Could be. And someone says they need to be tested for special ed. And then they're tested for special ed and they're placed on a track and they're labeled disabled for the rest of their lives. And as a result, they would rather be known as they go through school as a behavior problem mm -hmm. rather than an academic casualty. My, my. And so as a result, kids will act out. My, my. And teachers can't do anything with them. They, they know their behavior problems. They know they're behind. Teachers, the joy is gone in the teacher. The joy is gone in the student. And, and that's what it is. So if we want to turn it around, mm -hmm. we've got to help parents understand the state of Alabama in particular has labeled schools failing schools. I disagree. There's no such thing as a failing building. Mm -hmm. The problem is failing parents. Mm -hmm. And we in the community, churches included, have got to begin to engage in developing programs that help parents understand their roles and how to help their children at the preschool level. It's too late in high school. Mm -hmm. It needs to happen early. Change is coming. Those of you who are looking for somebody to stand up for you, it's here. I'm going to say to you, there is no pretty way to deal with an ugly situation. Let me say it again. Ain't no pretty way to deal with an ugly situation, but there is a moral, intelligent way to deal with it. And those who don't believe that this ain't going nowhere, we're going to hold you accountable for what you are doing in every position that you are in that affects the future of our most precious resource, and that's our kids in Alabama. It's a, the solution to this is Alabama first real talk show to deal with real issues that real people face to bring about real solutions and real change. We want to thank you for tuning in. We want to thank you for watching. But this show is for every Alabamian to take their rightful place to change in the face of Alabama. If you don't believe in change, just may God bless you, may God keep you, is my prayer.